Welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to, di to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Bridget Smudrick, a CLIA specialist for doctor's management who brings nearly two decades of experience in clinical testing from both hospital and independent la laboratory environments. Her extensive experience ranges from basic hematology and chemistry to high compl complexity genetic testing. Mrs. Smud Smudrick earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Tennessee and is professionally licensed as both the medical technologist and as a general laboratory supervisor by the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. Prior to joining Doctors Management, Mrs. Smudrick was the laboratory supervisor for Synergy Health Systems, where she managed all aspects of the lab from specimen collection to chart documentation of patient results for multiple physician offices. She also served as lab manager for Altair Laboratory, coordinating phlebotomy trials, supervising customer service, acting as physician liaison and reviewing results being distributed to over 30 collection sites. A copy of the slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM CEU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. Bridget, go ahead. Thank you, Catherine. I'm thankful to First Healthcare Compliance for this opportunity to speak to you today, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the title is Current Laboratory Inspections, What to Expect When Your Surveyor Arrives. At the end of this session, you should be able to know how your survey proceeds, organize your data for a smooth survey, avoid any survey pitfalls, and develop a plan of corrective actions. Scheduling your survey. Okay, so scheduling should be completed during your normal hours of operation. Your surveyor is not going to ask you to come in early or stay late. New labs will be observed during three months after opening, usually a little bit longer, but it can be as early as three months. If you're looking to recertify your laboratory, it could happen between three to six months prior to the certificate expiration of your CLIA certificate. Your laboratory may request up to 10 blackout dates. These should be requested in advance. Your date provided to the lab could become up to two weeks in advance, so that means that you may get up to two weeks heads up that your survey is due. Your laboratory might be allowed to reschedule one time for a compelling reason. Some surveys may be unscheduled, meaning that your inspector will arrive with no notice. Um, you can request the CMS 116 or update your information on COLA Central, uh, depending on if you're a COLA lab or strictly a CLIA lab. CLIA does inspect 5% of all COLA laboratories, um, either concurrently with the CLIA inspector or afterwards, and this is part of their quality assurance plan. Okay, survey notification. You may receive your notice from CLIA or COLA that you're going to be inspected or surveyed. Um, they will let you know a maximum of two weeks early, no longer, but it might be a shorter period of time. CLIA will notify the lab by phone or fax. COLA will send a COLA alert via email. And you then will go to your COLA Central via your login for details. 
Your director or technical consultant do not have to be present during a survey. COLA will ask for updated demographics every six months and then again at your time of your survey on COLA Central. CLIA requires submission of a new CLIA 116, the form that you filled out when you started your laboratory, immediately before or at the time of your survey. So how does the survey process begin? First, we start with the forms that have to be completed to verify or update information that may have changed after or before your application process began. Your CLIA application, your CMS 116, this form was last updated on CLIA in October of 20, 2010. Um, the disclosure of ownership will need to be filled out. Laboratory personnel report, this form is CMS form 209. Current test volumes and your current test menu. Hours of operation and directions to your laboratory. COLA sends alerts on COLA Central to request any updates about every six months Plus, they send select forms as reminders throughout the year. You should complete all the information as instructed. Upon arrival, your surveyors will introduce themselves and present their credentials and ask to speak with the person in charge of your laboratory. This does not necessarily mean they're going to ask for your director. Process overview, they're going to verify the ownership Verify the director and your laboratory personnel that you currently have working in your lab. Request test menus and volumes. They will then take a tour of your laboratory. Review personnel files for qualification records. Review your manuals, your quality control, quality assessment, proficiency testing, documentation, etc. Things like that. They'll then check for requisitions, reports, patient records and then they will probably ask you a few questions about things that they've found so far. They may ask you questions about how your workday proceeds, um, things along that line. Your survey will end when your surveyor will come through. They will verbally summarize what they found. Um, COLA provides you a list of deficiencies by circling their guideline numbers that correspond to the COLA criteria in the accreditation manual that you received when you signed up with COLA. They will provide advice for improvement, ask you if you have any questions, and then leave an evaluation survey or a link for how they did as a surveyor so you get to evaluate them. And a written report will come later. CLIA will send a plan of corrective actions or PCA. COLA will send a plan of required improvements or PRI. So how do you get prepared for a survey? You want to start as soon as possible. Keep your lab clean. Check your fire extinguishers and eyewash stations. Discard any unlabeled or outdated or discontinued reagents, kits, or specimen containers, including anything in a phlebotomy area or an exam room or a treatment room. Remove all data from your lab that's more than two years old. So what this means is if it was reviewed during your previous inspection, then you can shred or store it elsewhere. The only exceptions to this would be any immunohematology data or pathology data or any analyzer installation data. That should be kept for the lifetime of the analyzer. So organizing your data is very important. You need to be ready when your surveyor arrives. Have your forms 116 and 209 and your ownership form already completed. Uh, get out your CLIA certificate. Make a copy for the surveyor. Obtain a copy of your CLIA certificate for each reference lab that you use. This would also include any sister lab within your organization, uh, meaning someone, if you have more than one laboratory, you would also need their CLIA certificate. You should have a copy of the director's credentials available. Calculate your test volumes in advance. There are guidelines for counting tests on CLIA's website 
Or if you're a COLA lab, there's a form free on COLA's website to aid in this process. Find the report from your previous survey with all your corrective actions, even if it's already been submitted to COLA or CLIA. So clean the desk or the table where your surveyor is going to work. Have all your documentation available for the surveyor. The forms that we spoke of earlier, your 116 and 209, all personnel files, all manuals, including your procedure manual, manufacturer's user manuals, package inserts, reference lab catalog, safety manual, installation records, calibration and cal verification data, maintenance logs, quality control and control verification documentation, proficiency testing reports, everything that you get from the paperwork that you receive when you first get your specimens all the way to your graded results, quality assessment records, corrective action documentation, and sample requisitions and reports. So cleaning your desk or table where the surveyors work is just a courtesy. You want to make sure that everything has been disinfected for where they're going to be and try to have a clean out of the way area for them to complete their job. Have all documentation available for your surveyor, your personnel files on everyone working in the lab, your manuals, the forms that we spoke of earlier, any installation records for new systems should also be included at this time during your survey. So organizing your data is as easy as using binders or accordion folders. Also, you could use electronic storage if you prefer or you don't have the room for all the binders that's all that are required. Have any calibration documentation separated from daily QC. This makes it a little more accessible and more readily available to go through when the surveyor is there looking for your calibration data. You want to keep your calibration and cal verification quality control and quality control verification together for each analyzer, meaning having a separate binder for each one of the analyzers that you use. You want to organize your data chronologically within each testing specialty, meaning hematology or chemistry, immunohematology. Put all of your proficiency testing data together, including your instrument printouts and any corrective actions. And then, most importantly, have a pen and pad ready to take notes for any suggestions that your surveyor may have. <clears throat> for an example of your hematology data, let's put a binder together. and You could label that binder as hematology or CBCs if that's all that you do. It may be electronic. You do not have to have a physical binder. It just needs to be readily accessible during survey. You want to divide your binder or file into sections, having your installation and service records separated from calibration and cal verification data, your routine data with your most recent month at the front of your binder, any QC printouts, IQAP reports, or daily printouts, meaning for startup or background controls and patients. You should have a personnel file for everyone that works in your laboratory, from your director all the way down to the testing personnel. Mid-levels file for anyone who's performing provider perform microscopies. You should have education on file for your director, which should be a medical doctor plus any lab training and experience. You should have documentation of that or documentation if, of their boards if they're a certified PhD. Now a little more in depth about the personnel files. Education you should have your, for your director would be an MD plus their lab training and experience, all documented. The boards if they're a certified PhD. If you're looking for an MS or a BS, have their experience available and documented. A BS would be a total of four years experience, including two years of supervision for any non-wave testing. For your clinical consultant, you need a license to practice medicine and that should be on file in your personnel. 
technical consultant, a minimum of a bachelor's in laboratory science, plus two years experience in non-wave specialty or a subspecialty of service. For your testing personnel, and this is where we've seen um, sort of an uptake lately with especially COLA surveyors, is being able to produce the highest level of formal education that your testing personnel has received. This could be a high school diploma, transcript, or GED, all the way up to a college degree. It must be from an accredited school, especially if the person was homeschooled. If your testing personnel has received their education outside the United States, they must have an equivalency report and that needs to be on record in their personnel file. Laboratory certificates, licenses, and registrations need to be in the personnel file if it is required by your state, and all of these are very state specific. Licenses, certificates, registrations do not substitute for proof of formal education. All personnel, a state license on file, again, if it is required by your state. Personnel files, continuing on with this topic, your education could be the lab training, including a training to work in the lab that's being inspected and previous lab training that pertains to the lab that's being inspected. You should have your competency reports, in your personnel file, and those competencies are required to be performed by the director or technical consultant. The laboratory director will evaluate your technical consultant for your lab. Competencies are done at three levels for a new hire. Your initial is required by COLA, and some states will require an initial competency. For a new hire, the next competency required would be at six months and then at one year of employment, all other personnel are tested on for their competency each year after their first year of employment. Continuing education is required by COLA. No amount or type is really specified. It may be from meetings or reading or any CBT or computer-based training that you received. Another requirement for COLA labs specifically is annual OSHA training, and this should be documented within the personnel file. OSHA required personnel files. They should be confidential employee medical files. It is required by OSHA, not by CLIA or COLA. It should include the, the personnel's name, social security number, Hepatitis B vaccination documentation is also required by COLA and CLIA, as well as OSHA. So in this file, you should have either documentation that they have had their hepatitis B vaccination, a signed declination form where they have declined to be vaccinated, their titer report showing that they have a good titer for the vaccination that they had received before, and any exposure records if that applies to that personnel. Procedure manuals. Your procedure manuals should include your manufacturer's instructions, user guides, and everything from the manufacturer pertaining to that test and or instrument. And documentation is required by the director showing approval for this test method. Laboratory operating procedures should be reviewed and signed by the current lab director. Any changes or additions or revisions must also be signed when the change or addition takes place by the laboratory director. Include all current and non-wave procedures provided for microscopies and the date that they were implemented. You should have a written procedure even for your wave test. This could even be something as simple as your package insert from the manufacturer. COLA does require procedures for wave tests, but will accept your package insert as that procedure. You should date and remove any discontinued procedures, and those should be stored elsewhere outside of your procedure manual for two years. Your procedure manual should include 
your site specific information, specifically who orders the tests and how are they ordered, what to do if controls are not acceptable, actions taken if the system is not operable, specify that no one will alter any reference lab tests received, state how and to whom results are reported. You should include the date the procedure was implemented and your discontinued date if and when that should occur. You may reference or include any package inserts, user manuals, or textbooks. Some other manuals that are important for your laboratory, your quality assessment plan and monitoring. It may be incorporated into your procedure manual, but your quality assurance plan must be reviewed and signed by the director both initially and annually. Include all monitoring documentation, also signed by the director. Safety manuals and equipment like your OSHA policy and procedure manual, your safety data sheet binder, eyewash station and fire extinguishers should be documented that they are properly located as well as maintained. Reference laboratory manual. These manuals could be online, but they need to be current for all the reference laboratories that you use. And finally, the employees should read and sign your procedure manual. Package inserts. Package inserts should be maintained for each piece of equipment, whether it be a microscope or thermometer, pipette or centrifuge. It should be maintained for every kit that you use and for every test. Specifically within each test, any reagents and diluents that are used, calibrators and controls. So some tips to remember would be read the entire package insert. Don't just go directly to the how-to portion. Uh, we've seen some examples of recent citations. Um, we're going to talk about those a little bit. Um, incubating the strep cultures longer than 24 hours. While most strep culture media will allow for 48 hour incubation, your disc does not. So you need to go to the limiting factor, which would be the disc, and that disc could say 18 to 24 hours. If it does, then your strep cultures cannot be incubated longer than the 24 hours specified by the disc. Failure to attach a methodology statement to tumor markers. An example for that would be PSA. And your comment needs to simply say that values obtained with different assays cannot be used interchangeably. A lack of documentation on pre and post counseling for HIV testing. This was specific to the Clearview HIV 1-2 stat pack. It has a subject information notice included in the kit. You can use that, make copies of it, have the patient sign and witness sign that pre and post counseling was performed. QC frequency not being followed. An example of this was pregnancy testing. A kit required monthly quality control with the kit as well as every new lot and shipment and this was not being performed. Quality control documentation. With your calibration records you need to keep everything your packet from your package insert to your results. All the instrument printouts, including pre and post cal factors, precision studies, carryover if it's required for that specific instrument, documentation that controls were ran after calibration, and the new calibration factors. Your calibration verification is required if fewer than three levels of calibrators are used. For quality control documentation, you should include your package insert for controls, your control verification that was performed before you started testing patients, data summary and graphs, your IQAP reports. Participation in IQAP, by the way, is not required, but it is encouraged.
corrective actions for unacceptable controls, evidence of director involvement, and documentation of a weekly review of Levy Jennings graphs, which is required only by COLA. The calibration documentation, you keep everything. Just want to reiterate that it's very important that you keep your package insert for your calibrators, all instrument printouts, your precision studies, carryover, that you ran controls after calibration, and always keep your documentation that calibration verification was performed. It's required every six months, and calibration verification is done if fewer than three calibrator levels are used. Instrumentation documentation, instrument maintenance, first of all. So your instrument startup, background counts, and system checks. We need to maintain all of that data in your binder for each specific test. Preventative maintenance, your cleaning schedule, your professional maintenance, any repairs and part replacement performed by our service tech including any centrifuges and microscopes. This is not just for instruments. As far as your facilities go, your temperature and humidity log should be maintained, your water quality data, purification systems for chemistry instruments, and your electricity for you need to have a downtime procedure for if your, your electricity goes out, the space. You need to make sure your space is adequate for the job that you're performing as well as your instrument. Some chemistry analyzers have a certain amount of footage around the instrument that they are required to perform optimally. Corrective actions for any unacceptable conditions. These can be kept or maintained in a corrective actions log, which could be part of your procedure manual, but doesn't have to be. Now let's move on to proficiency testing. Your initial documentation. So you need to have proof of your invoice with enrollment. If it's close to the year where you're going to change or if you haven't had any tests since your annual enrollment, package inserts for online printouts with a date of receipt, handwritten logs, instrument printouts, the date of testing and testing personnel identified an original or copy of results submitted for grading, all attestation statements signed by the director and all operators. COLA is now strongly recommending proficiency testing for all WAVE tests. If it's not performed at the time of your survey, it's currently being cited as an educational citation. Your graded report, you will receive that in the mail or via email by your proficiency testing provider. This documentation should be signed by the director and or technical consultant. The director can assign this responsibility in writing to the technical consultant. All participating testing personnel should also sign the review of the graded report. You should keep all investigations performed for unacceptable results. Even one unsatisfactory answer should be investigated. Corrective actions if necessary, including any repeat testing. You should indicate if patients have been affected and what was done for those patients. If analyzer was out of service is what you reported at the time your proficiency testing was due. You need to make sure that you have documentations of any corrective actions, any service work that was performed on your instrument. Your enrollment form and your invoice, you should provide that if your survey is at the beginning of the year and you have no documentation as of yet for that year as far as any testing that you've done. You'll be asked to provide this for the next year if your survey is near the end of your current year. Twice yearly proficiency testing for unregulated analytes, provider perform microscopies, or tests for which there is no proficiency testing. So what you would do with these is perform split specimen testing with your reference laboratory. You should establish your own acceptable limits and use five specimens to, as proof. Keep all of your documentation for this and you should have a written procedure 
for what you're going to do for this process. Patient records. Whether you use patient paper charts or electronic health records or EHR, your in-house testing and referred tests should all be maintained the results. Your surveyor may ask you to pull some examples and they may also choose themselves from lab logs which examples they would like to see. You must keep instrument printouts if they were generated but they do not have to be in the charts. You can shred if your information is scanned into the EHR, but if those results are manually entered, you must keep the printouts. And just a little tidbit here, um, do not use tape on thermal printouts. The results will disappear within a certain period of time. Your surveyor will review your patient charts and it's not a HIPAA violation. This is included as a quality improvement function as far as CLIA is concerned, with COLA, it falls under the Business Associate Agreement. Desk reviews. What will trigger a desk review would be a second time failure on any two out of three proficiency testing events deemed unsuccessful for the same analyte. For example, if you have failed proficiency and are unsuccessful on thyroid stimulating hormone on events one and two, it may trigger a desk review. Your surveyor will get the proficiency testing results and will send a plan of corrections which will need to be completed. You must respond by the specified deadline in the letter. If the plan is not submitted in a timely manner or if this plan is not accepted, the lab may be subject to an unannounced inspection. Electronic data. You need to verify that all your information is available. Are all the results that you were expecting for this patient there? Did the reference lab report get pulled into the EHR? Is the name and address of the lab on that report? You need to verify that information is accurate and document this verification. A surveyor may ask you for your LIS verification, so you'll need to keep all of this documentation. They're looking for if the report got into the correct chart. You need to document the right result crossed over into the correct slot. So like if you have a Chem 13 or a Chem 20, you need to make sure that the sodium results got into the sodium results column in your LIS. Do the results in the electronic health record actually match the results on your printout? And do they remain the same over a certain period of time? Are the results, are the units of measure available with those results? And are the calculations correct, like for your EGFR, for example? Physician portals into hospitals um, are a, something you need to be careful and just be aware that that report, as it's being transmitted, may not have the hospital name and address which all results require the laboratory name and address for where that test was performed. So some COLA specifics to be aware of if you're a COLA laboratory. It's a requirement that their COLA notice be posted. You need to have an incident management plan and documentation of any qualifying incidents should be kept in this plan. Proof of training for the FDA reporting policy. Um, CLIA may also ask for this, but COLA is uh, specifically asking for this. LIS policies and procedures, like the LIS verification we just spoke of. CLIA will most likely develop guidelines for this in the future, but do not have any currently. And also, COLA specifically looks for the director's signature on your manuals each year. So on to inspection preparation checklist. You'll have a separate handout primarily for CLIA labs. With COLA labs you can refer to the COLA self-assessment in section 3 of your COLA accreditation manual. COLA criteria for 
quality laboratory performance is available free with your COLA account. And the most recent update was found in April of 2017. Okay, so now we see we've got a plan of corrective actions or a plan of required improvements. So don't panic. CLIA and COLA will not take your firstborn child, unlike how it feels when you get that letter. Read and date the report as soon as you receive it. You'll be required to respond in a certain amount of time, and it's important that you know when that date and time will be. Make a working copy and file your original report. You can use plain paper to draft your response. You need to respond to every deficiency and transfer that deficiency response to your form that you're going to submit to your accrediting agency only when you're satisfied with your work. Plan of corrective actions or plan of required improvements. This is a, you need to document what you plan to do about the deficiency, what you will do for any patients that were affected, who will be responsible for making sure this happens and does not happen in the future, when your corrective actions will be completed, how you plan to prevent future recurrence, and have your director or authorized individual must sign your form. You need to make a copy and keep a copy ready so that way you can have it for your next survey. Your surveyor will ask for any corrective actions. You need to submit your response within 10 days of receiving your notice from your accrediting agency. You need to send documentation of what you are going to do in response to your citations only if it's specified. You may be given more time for submitting completed work and your surveyor, again, will review all of your corrective actions at the next survey. CLIA, with CLIA, you will get, after a survey, the Plan of Corrective Actions, or PCA. You must document on the form provided, but you can add any pages as attachments if you need to, cre to create a form or a new procedure as a result of your inspection. You should always indicate on the attachments the CLIA's ID number and the D tag that's being addressed. We'll show examples of this um, in the next slide. Your director must sign the first page as a response. And you should submit it by the deadline given. You may be allowed additional time to complete any extra work like creating procedures or new forms. This is an example of what your plan of corrective actions from CLIA would look like. The extreme left-hand side is the D tag that we spoke of. And the next column is a description of the specific citation and what was violated and how, a little further down, how your lab failed to perform. The wording says this condition is not met as evidenced by and that will explain. And then the next line is the D tag again. On the next to last column is where you would write your corrective action. And then the last column is there for a completion date. With COLA, you have a plan of required improvements or PRI. You need to indicate on every sheet the laboratory's COLA ID number and the criteria being addressed. Your director also must sign. You should submit it by the deadline given. And like CLIA, you may have an additional time to complete the work if needed. You may upload your corrective actions on COLA Central, fax in your response, or email it to COLA. This is an example of the PRI that you could receive from COLA with your citations listed. On the extreme left column, you'll see the citation, specific citation numbers, for example, PT9. Then you'll have a category. These are assigned as general. The next column shows which policy was violated. The next column will show how specifically your lab did not meet the requirements. 
And then the next column is called Action Required. This is what COLA expects you to do about responding to the specific criteria. And at the last column is what they want you to send to them as a response to this citation. For some frequent deficiencies and the appropriate corrective actions that we have found to work. Um, the next few slides will be on this topic. So your first deficiency would be you're missing the high school diploma and or college degrees. Corrective action response for this citation could be the laboratory supervisor is responsible for obtaining high school diplomas for all testing personnel within 10 days of employment. Potential employees must present documentation prior to hire. Deficiency number two, lack of director involvement. The lab supervisor will immediately begin taking all quality control and proficiency testing data to the director for a monthly review. The director is responsible. Deficiency number three, no employee competency assessments. A corrective action response for this could be the director is responsible for each tech evaluation. She will perform them within the next three weeks and again next year. Continuing with frequent deficiencies, number four, the lack of annual bloodborne pathogen training. Your safety coordinator is responsible for providing this training. She will have all training completed by, you can give a specific date, like November 29th of 2018. New hires must be offered the training on the first day of work before being put at risk for exposure. Deficiency number five, no proficiency testing for microscopies. The lab supervisor has been assigned this responsibility for ensuring that split specimen testing is done. She will develop and implement a procedure within the next six months. Number six, proficiency procedures, sorry, uh, lack slide preparation and evaluation. The lab supervisor will write a procedure for preparation of slides and evaluation of adequate slides by, and again, you can give a specific date like we did here. Deficiency number seven is no documentation of panic values or rejected specimens. The supervisor will develop and implement a policy for documenting actions for panic values and for documenting disposition of rejected specimens. This will be completed by, and again, you can give a specific date. Continuing on with deficiencies and corrective actions, number eight, the missing package inserts for controls and calibrators. The director will ensure that the lab maintains all package inserts. Failure to maintain all documentation for two years. The lab supervisor is responsible for ensuring that all documentation is maintained for at least two years. This is something that we see quite frequently as package inserts and other documentation for specifically calibration tends to disappear, as well as um, those high school diplomas that you knew you put in your personnel file. Number 10, no corrective actions for previous inspection deficiencies. Your technical consultant is responsible for responding to all CLIA surveys. She will immediately prepare the response for this inspection and return it within 10 days. She will also prepare the response for the previous survey within two weeks and it will be kept on file. Some information resources that we thought we would give you uh, if you're a COLA laboratory, you're www.cola.org. You can find accreditation manuals there, lab facts, and education from colacentral.com. www.cmshhs.gov.clia forward slash regulations and surveyor guidelines and certain CLIA brochures uh, to help you learn the regulations for what you're expected at your laboratory depending on what type of CLIA certificate waiver. And also um, with my company, www.doctorsmanagement.com, AAPOL or www.doctorsmanagement.com. We have recorded webcasts, frequently asked questions, links, and order forms. 
now we have some time to take some questions. Okay, um, thank you, Bridget. Um, that was a great presentation. So we did have um, a few questions that came in. So um, the first one that came in was, um, will a medical assistant certification suffice as documentation of education? Okay, no, um, your education should be documented by the highest level of formal education, meaning a transcript or a diploma from high school or college. Okay, all right. Um, Good, all right. And then um, we had another question, and the second question was, can lab employees evaluate each other for the required competency assessments? No, Catherine, the competency assessments are to be completed by the lab director or technical consultant. Okay, all right, so um, the lab employees can't do that. Um, no. Okay, um, and then, Okay, it looks like we had another question. Um, all right, it's uh, for unsuccessful proficiency testing performance, will ceased testing be accepted as a response to a desk review? No, ceased testing is not an acceptable response to a desk review. Um, you need to prove that no harm came to patients during the time frame of the failed proficiency testing. You can show this by providing that um, any past calibrations and quality control for all days that the patients were being tested. In addition, um, a chronological order of results previous to the time of failed proficiency testing and following and during to show that the clinical outcome and diagnosis of the patient remained the same. Okay, and then, um Bridget, can I ask you a favor? Can you put the previous slide up where you have um, some contact information there? Sure. Okay. Okay, great. So um, so our attendees can use this um, contact information there, it looks like. Um, uh, and so if they, if they need to get a hold of you, can they find you if they go to um, doctor's management or um, information about, about that? Or um, what's yes. the best way to get a hold of to get a hold of you or to find more information? I guess to find more information, how, how would they, what, what's the best way? Specifically for doctor's management or just myself? Um, either way. Okay, um, specifically for me, um, our number here at doctor's management is 1-800-635-4040. Or you could email me at bsmudrick at drsmgmt.com. Okay, great. All right, and if our if our listeners um, had missed that, we can they can uh, feel free to send their questions to us, and we would forward them on to you. Okay. Um, yeah, we can do that also, and and our listeners also, if you would like to register also for any future webinars. Um, or to request a demo of our compliance solution, um, you can register at our website, which is firsthcc.com. So that's 1sthcc.com, or call us at 888-543-4778. And I wanted to thank you so much, Bridget. Um, thank you so much for um, telling us about this information. It was it was um, very, very interesting and, and very informative. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much to you, and thank you to our listeners. And so thank you. Um, really appreciate that. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, and um, thank you to our listeners, and thank you so much for joining us.